Um, and so she is, um, she's been taken on the, the lion's share of actually doing any of the um, educational curriculum development, assessment development. Um, and so uh, that's what we'll, we'll have her talk a little bit about the project. And then, um, and then we'll see if, I don't know if Dr. Price can be on today. I think he's in the OR. Um, and then we'll see if anybody else has any comments. And, and Leaf, certainly, um, if you have any lessons that you've learned from this um, project from that educational standpoint, um, you can share with us as well. Um, but thanks to everybody for coming today. So our speaker is Anna, our Anna Dreley Anderson, who's our education programs manager. She's got a master's in education, specifically in surgical education and gradu graduate medical education. Um, and so knows a lot about curriculum development and assessment. And a lot of our work obviously has to do with creating new programs, creating new educational programs specifically. Um, and most of us probably don't have much of an experience, much training in formal curriculum development or assessment development. Um, so uh, using the Cambodia work as an example, I'm hoping that Anna will kind of teach us a little bit about how to think about uh, creating programs and uh, and assessing programs. So go ahead and take it away, Anna. You got it. All right, let me share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay, cool. All right. So like Dr. Jayaraman already mentioned, uh, I'm Anna Dreli anderson for those who don't know me, I'm the Associate Director of Education and Programs Manager for the Division of General Surgery and the Center for Global Surgery here at the University of Utah. And I'll be speaking on one of our center's ongoing projects, the establishment of laparoscopic surgery training in Cambodia, while also discussing program development in medical education in general. So one of the very first things to consider in putting together curriculum is which program development model to use. Many models exist, for example, the simple five-step ADDIE model. It is an iterative instructional design process developed in the 70s for the military, but that has been used in countless environments since. Though it appears to be linear, it doesn't have to be followed as such, especially one already has course materials developed. David Kern's six-step model created in 1998 is a similar one popular in medical education, and one will loosely follow throughout the rest of this presentation. The main difference between those two is that the analysis phase in the ADDIE model is split into two in Kern's model. This model follows six steps. One, problem identification and general needs assessments or contextual analysis. Two, targeted needs assessment. Three, goals and objectives. Four, educational strategies, implementation, and then finally, evaluation and feedback. Finally, I'd be remiss not to mention another more recent model that I often use, Caffarella's. Rosemary Caffarella's interactive model of program planning provides an interesting approach. With no particular beginning or ending, it is a much more detailed in certain regards and places the decision-making process within the hands of the person responsible for planning programs. So your first step is to identify any problems you'd like to address, uh, brainstorm them, and then select one. Questions to consider during this step are who is affected? Uh, is it patients, providers? Uh, medical educators, society. How important is the problem, both quantitatively and qualitatively? What contributes to it? What does it affect? Does it affect clinical outcomes, quality of life, use of resources, patient or provider satisfaction, societal function, etc.? You then want to determine the purpose or purposes of the program you want to create to address the problem. In general, a program may fulfill one or more of five general purposes. Modified for medical education, these are one, to encourage continuous growth and development of individuals, uh, think faculty, staff, or trainee development, two, to assist medical personnel in responding to practical or clinical problems and issues in medicine, three, to prepare people for current and future work opportunities, such as um, a residency or fellowship program would fulfill this purpose nicely, uh, four, to assist medical centers in achieving desired results and adapting to change. Or five, to provide opportunities to examine medical community and related societal issues, foster change for the common good, and promote a civil and healthy society. 
Finally, you'll want to think through what kinds of programs would address your problem and fulfill your purpose or purposes. Uh, train the trainer laparoscopic surgery training workshop or an introduction to global surgery course, things like this. The second part of Curran's first step involves a general needs assessment or contextual analysis. Context is the human, organizational, and environmental factors that affect decision planners make about programs. And it's these three main elements, the individual, the organization, and the environment that make up the levels of contextual analysis. On the individual level of analysis, the program is analyzed in terms of its expected impact on the individual participants and on program implementers. Analysis also examines how anticipated individual needs and cultural values will affect program design. On the organizational level, program benefits for hosting and or supporting benefits are identified. Uh, consideration should be given to how programs might support or challenge organizational culture and operations. And then on the environmental level, program impact is examined in terms of broader impacts on the economy, politics, and society. The analysis identifies constraints or supports for program outcomes. Factors to consider would be structural organizational factors, such as decision-making and standard operating procedures, political factors like coalition building and power relations, and cultural factors, uh, the history and traditions of your medical center, your organizational symbols, social classes, ideologies, ways of knowing and learning, etc. Uh, sources you could use to obtain information about planning context are written documents, such as annual reports, policies and procedures manuals, journal articles, government documents, uh, people, your colleagues, program planners from other organizations, professional educators, supervisors, community and business leaders and activists, political and social scientists, et cetera, uh, group meetings and gatherings, such as boards and committees, work teams, social gatherings, formal lectures and seminars, uh, professional and social or specialty association. Two, two seconds, let me shut the door. Apologies. Adorable dogs, but super loud. Um, professional and specialty associations, your local, regional, national, international conferences and meetings, networking groups, chats with key leaders, and then finally, technology-based sources such as websites, emails, online forums, listservs, etc. cetera. Current's second step of the program planning is a targeted needs assessment once you've already completed your contextual analysis. And this can be an entire project of its own within the program planning process. The first element of a needs assessment is to make a conscious decision to complete one with a commitment to planning. The next step is to identify individuals to be involved in planning and overseeing the needs assessment and develop a management plan. Once your team is set, you'll want to develop the context, purpose, and specific objectives for the needs assessment to ensure it answers the questions you really want to know. At this point, you should lay out the target dates, timelines, budget, and staff. Switching focus, you should then select the specific individuals and or groups to be the respondents for the needs assessment. And once you've chosen your target population, determine data collection techniques to be used. Upon deciding which techniques to employ, ensure data are collected in an appropriate and timely manner. And then after gathering your data, you should break down collected information to determine the basic findings in terms of quantitative and qualitative descriptions, points of agreements and disagreements, and agree upon findings and conclusions concerning identified needs and ideas. Next, you should sort and prioritize each of the identified needs and indicate which needs should be responded to first, second, and so on, and needs for which alternative interventions are more appropriate. For example, changes in the reward system, installation of needed equipment, changes in organizational structure, etc. Finally, you'll want to distribute the results of the needs assessment to appropriate individuals and groups within and external to the organization. Moving on to the third step, goals and objectives. The first thing to note is the difference between the two. Um, that's something that I've noticed some people don't necessarily um, differentiate between them, and there is a difference. Goals are broad statements of purpose or intent meant to answer the why. Why are we doing this? Why is the program worth doing? And then program objectives, on the other hand, provide clear statements of anticipated results. They serve as a foundation for instructional plans. They're concrete guidelines for developing transfer of learning plans, and they act as benchmarks against which programs are evaluated. 
So putting it all together for our project in Cambodia. As I'm sure some, but perhaps not all of you know, minimally invasive or laparoscopic surgery can be used to treat surgical conditions of the gallbladder, appendix, colon, and many obstetric procedures. Benefits of minimally invasive surgery, or MIS, include fewer complications, reduced post-operative pain, quicker recovery time, and shorter hospital stays. In high-income countries, laparoscopy has been used to treat these conditions since at least the 1980s. However, the implementation of MIS in low- and middle-income countries, or LMICs, while increasing in more recent years, has been difficult. Nine of 10 people in LMICs do not have access to safe, affordable surgical and anesthesia care. Indeed, Southeast Asia alone has an unmet surgical need of nearly 12.5 million surgical procedures each year. Reasons for this include direct and indirect costs to both patients and hospitals, a scarcity of formal medical education, leading to a general lack of healthcare personnel, limited local resources, social and political matters, and issues of distance, poor roads, and insufficient suitable transport. Additionally, LMICs not only struggle with a shortage of trained surgeons, with Cambodia boasting an estimated surgical workforce of four per 100,000 population compared to the 20 per 100,000 population recommended by the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, but also proper training opportunities for further specialization in areas like laparoscopy. Laparoscopic surgery first came to Cambodia in the early 2000s, though there remains no standardized training for laparoscopic surgery within the country. As such, Calmet Hospital in their capital of Phnom Penh requested assistance from the University of Utah Center for Global Surgery to expand their surgical training avenues in the country. Thus, the objectives of this project were one, to develop and establish a sustainable basic laparoscopic surgery training program for use in Cambodia and other LMICs, and two, to critically assess the current state of minimally invasive surgery and training pathways at centers such as Calmet Hospital. Her next step was then to begin developing the program. Step four of Kern's model focuses on educational strategies or instruction of the program. Once goals and objectives have been determined and clarified, curriculum content is chosen and educational methods are selected that will most likely achieve the educational objectives. The first thing you'll want to focus on in this section is content. For example, what laparoscopic skills would you want to teach your residents, which would help you fulfill the goals and objectives you've just outlined? Once you've decided on the content, don't forget to write learning objectives for each skill, remembering to match them up with your overall program objectives and goals. In addition to development models, the program planners must consider a variety of learning frameworks. In relation to this particular project, I focused on three. One was Bloom's Taxonomy, a set of hierarchical models used for classification of educational learning objectives into levels of complexity and specificity uh, in which the learning experience becomes more active as learners progress through the program. The second was Kolb's 1984 Theory of Experiential Learning, which is a holistic approach that emphasizes how experiences, including environmental factors, cognition, et cetera, influence the learning process. And finally, Miller's Prism, a valuable tool created in 1990 as a framework for assessing levels of clinical competence, similar to Bloom's taxonomy for use specifically in medical education. As you can see, the lower two levels of Miller's Prism only test cognition or knowledge. This is the area where inexperienced trainees usually sit. For example, they either know something about basic laparoscopic skills or they know how to perform a basic laparoscopic skill. The upper two levels test behavior. Can they apply what they know into practice? Can they show how to perform a basic laparoscopic skill or do they actually do laparoscopic surgery in practice? Within our MIS training program, which I'll go over in a second, we've made sure to follow the levels modeled in Miller's Prism. Briefly, we first provide instruction on several laparoscopic skills by way of presentations. This will be the nose level. We show learners how to perform each skill via videos and knows how. And we enforce learning through hands-on training by having them physically practice each skill, shows. Ending with them having to evaluate themselves and each other on how well they've completed them. Utilizing a combination of these development models and learning frameworks, a team of experts in minimally invasive general surgery, obstetrics and gynecology, anesthesiology, and medical education was amalgamated to conduct this project over a three-year period with the potential for expansion to 10 years. Implementation involves a number of components, procurement of support for the program, both buy-in required prior to implementation and funding support, 
Uh, identification and procurement of resources, such as personnel, time, space, costs, and, and identification of barriers and potential solutions. You'll want to think of scheduling, staffing, and budgeting. How many stations are available for use? Educators. How long do you have the space for? What kind of funding do you have or can secure? What supplies would need to be replenished? What other costs do you need to take into account? In this project, to begin with, an in-person two-week basic laparoscopic surgery training program was developed that included a didactic curriculum on principles of laparoscopic surgery and an educator workshop, a simulation skills course, and hands-on in-theater practical training component. Additionally, prior to implementation of training, sites infrastructures were evaluated and developed as needed. And furthermore, in-country visits were planned for twice a year with the objective of the initial trip being to establish the program at the country's flagship medical center, Calmet Hospital, and to evaluate additional sites for consideration. Subsequent trips involved the establishment of the program at a new site, checking in on the program established at the most recent site, and evaluating another site for inclusion. Accordingly, each site longitudinally benefited from direct interactions and feedback from our team of experts on at least three separate occasions. After deciding on the basic structure of the program, we then focused on the details of it, keeping the execution of the program in mind. The first aspect of the basic training program consisted of didactic instruction. The principles of laparoscopic surgery course was comprised of 10 modules, introducing the subject in the context of LMICs and on topics such as setting up the room for laparoscopy, troubleshooting, sterile techniques, etc. as you can see on the screen. Uh, due to the mixed nature of learners' backgrounds, we uh, pro provided additional content for both surgical and gynecological breakout sessions regarding particular applications in each specialty. Delivery of the didactic curriculum occurred in person and involved interactive elements such as live exhibition and demonstration of surgical instruments. However, in consideration of the scarcity of resources, the curriculum has also been adapted for use on an open source online learning platform. Thinkific is what we've got it on right now. For those learners who were already attending surgeons or OBGYNs and or who had the potential or interest to go on to teach minimally invasive surgical skills, namely those located at teaching hospitals or willing to travel to more rural areas to allow for knowledge transfer, an additional educator workshop was created on teaching laparoscopic surgery in LMICs. The course was comprised of five introductory modules on the subject and culminated in a final two-hour hands-on module on program development similar to kind of what I've been putting you through today, um, to provide them with an understanding of the general concepts of curriculum development and the skills to design a basic program in order to expand their medical education capabilities and for the purposes of sustainability. Another major component of our program was a surgical skills lab. Since the turn of the century, surgical skills labs have been used in high-income countries to enhance surgical training. Certainly, simulation training has proven to significantly improve surgeon skills, such as precision cutting and intracorporeal knot tying, all useful in MIS. Uh, so accordingly, we endeavored to create a blueprint for a small scale skills lab involving box simulators to be used in LMICs. The six training exercises viewed on screen were developed to be used with items easily purchased at low cost from retail stores, each with their own set of technical objectives to be met. The course was arranged an increasing level of difficulty, with the first exercise being the least difficult and the sixth the most difficult. One and a half hours were allotted to each of the first two tasks, which were the rubber band transfer and spandex, and two hours apiece for the remaining tasks. Each session began with an explanation of objectives, video and photo demonstration of the exercise, and review of scoring guidelines. Throughout the sessions, instructors also exhibited the skills on the box simulators themselves for each group. Then, participants were asked to first complete the task without any hands-on practice to determine baseline levels. They were subsequently allowed to practice the task for 15 minutes before officially attempting the exercise again. All learner skills were assessed using a standardized 10-point rubric measuring time, precision, and adherence to technique. Scores from each repetition were recorded and documented, and trainees were provided with ongoing feedback. And finally, to overcome uh, Ebenhaus's forgetting curve, participants were encouraged to continue practicing and recording their results on an ongoing basis after the initial course to determine retention and advancement of skills. Following didactic instruction and simulation training, learners were then provided supervised graduated hands-on in-theater experience. 
In preparation for the practical training components of the program, patients with outwardly straightforward cases requiring resection of the gallbladder were screened, selected, and scheduled for surgery based on urgency. Expert general surgeons first performed laparoscopic cholecystectomies while training is observed, taking time to one, explain each step and the reasoning behind their actions, two, demonstrate key points of the procedure, three, troubleshoot any complications that came up, and four, answer learners' questions in real time. The next phase of the training was much the same, with the addition of having the learners take turns assisting on the procedure. Once our surgical educators were confident that participants had the basic skills and understanding, trainees took turns taking the position of surgeon while our instructors served as assistants. Training progressed until students filled the roles of both surgeon and assistant under the supervision of our experts while we were there in person. Upon our departure, learners were able to complete laparoscopic cholecystectomies as a team entirely independently. All right, so while evaluation of this project is still ongoing, though early feedback and analysis of data is quite positive, I thought it was important to still go over the concept in general as well as next steps for us. The last step of Kern's model, as I said, uh, is evaluation and involves several components. It's usually best to assess the performance of both the learners, so individual evaluation, and the curriculum, which is the program evaluation. The purpose of evaluation may be formative, so to provide ongoing feedback for improvement, or summative, to provide a final grade or assessment of the performance of the learner or the curriculum. Evaluation can be used not only to drive the ongoing learning of participants and improvement of a curriculum, but also to gain support and resources for a curriculum, and to answer questions about the effectiveness of a specific curriculum or the relative merits of different educational approaches. A popular model of evaluation, the Kirkpatrick model, is a globally recognized method of evaluating the results of training and learning programs developed by Dr. Donald Kirkpatrick in the 1950s. It assesses both formal and informal training methods and rates them against four level of criteria, reaction, learning, impact, and results. The first level, reaction, measures whether learners find the training or education engaging, favorable, and relevant to their jobs. This level is most commonly assessed by a post-unit or post-program survey that asks students to rate their experience. A crucial component of level one analysis is a focus on the learner versus the educator or trainer. While the Kirkpatrick model encourages questions that concentrate on the learner's takeaways, you'll, you may still see surveys structured in a trainer-centered manner, as you can see on the screen right now. Level two, learning, gauges participants' learning based on whether learners acquire the intended knowledge, skills, attitude, confidence, and commitment to the training. This can be evaluated through both formal and informal methods and should be evaluated through pre- and post-learning assessments to identify accuracy and comprehension. Methods include exams or interview-style evaluations, and a defined clearing, uh, clear scoring process, so a rubric, must be determined in advance to reduce inconsistencies. One of the most essential steps in the Kirkpatrick model, uh, the third level, which is impact or behavior, measures whether participants were truly impacted by the learning and if they're applying what they learn. Assessing this impact makes it possible to not know not only whether the skills were understood, but if it's logically or logistically possible to use the skills in the workplace or life. Oftentimes, this type of evaluation uncovers issues within the workplace. A lack of behavioral change may not mean that the training or education was ineffective, but that the organization's current processes and cultural conditions aren't fostering an ideal learning environment for the desired change. Uh, finally, level four is dedicated to measuring direct results. It measures the learning against program outcomes, the key performance indicators that were established before learning was initiated. So using the Kirkpatrick model creates an actionable measurement plan to clearly define goals, measure results, and identify areas of notable impact. Analyzing data at each level allows the program and organization to evaluate the relationship between each level and to better understand the results. Finally, though not a part of Kern's model, but certainly Caffarella's newer model, it is important to have some sort of marketing and rollout plan for your program. If you want people to know about it and participate, <laughs> use your context and target audience analysis uh, to guide your marketing and rollout plan. Include organizational branding so that it's clear who the sponsor of the program is, and select and develop powerful messages to concisely get your point across. Decide which promotional materials and tools would serve you best, keeping in mind who your target audience is. 
Uh, and some examples are seen on screen. For example, you could also decide to utilize email to market your program internally and your center's website to promote it externally. However, your marketing is entirely up to you and the resources available to you. When creating a campaign plan, don't forget to also set a timeline and a budget. And to wrap up, I feel like you've just been talking into the void. <laughs> Besides performing an updated analysis of the feedback and evaluation data we've gathered thus far, our next steps in our MIS training project are one, to submit both our basic and educator courses to the United Nations Surge Hub platform, uh, which is an online open source learning management system for those who don't know, um, to allow for broader and easier availability, particularly to those in LMICs. And two, to finish drafting a manuscript on this experience and results for submission to a journal such as Global Surgical Education. We're also in the program planning stage of three more advanced courses on laparoscopic colectomy, laparoscopic foregut surgery, and anesthesia for laparoscopic surgery. Uh, this is all, of course, in addition to continuing to bring this basic program to other locations throughout Cambodia. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and hopefully nobody has questions, but if you do, go for it. <laughs>